Good afternoon and welcome to week 10 of our Lunchtime Live series. I'm Chandra Lucka, Director of Marketing and Communications here at Chris 180 and we're thrilled that you have joined us to take part in today's conversation. We will be discussing relationships during the COVID-19 crisis and especially as we get ready to re-enter our lives in the community and in the greater world. We want to have a conversation about what those relationships look like from romantic relationships to friendships to familiar relationships. Sometimes they are taking a stress and a toll on our lives and today we're here to discuss those things and be a resource for you during this time. So please leave your questions or comments or any remarks you have in the comment section here on Facebook or on Instagram and we'd love to answer those. Today our panelists include two licensed marriage and family therapists. The first, our president and CEO, Kathy Colvinson, and the second, Nisa Patel, one of our school-based mental health therapists. Thank you both for joining us and take it away. Okay, thanks so much. It's great to be here and to be able to talk about relationships because relationships are so important to human beings. And uh, I'm going to let Nisa start. So, um, you know, we've talked so much about how this pandemic has shifted um, our lives in so many different ways. And so I think a big way is the way we function our day to day and also in relationships. So, you know, Chandra, you said earlier, our uh, romantic relationships or friendships, um, if we cohabitate with other people, um, our family, whether they're close or far, we're seeing, um, we're seeing a big change in how we just interact with others and how that affects the, the core of our relationships with people in general. Yeah, it's really hard because we had markers to define our space before. We had at home, we had work, <clears throat> we had your room, my room, and we weren't cohabiting in the same space 100% right. of the time. Right. And that's what's happening now. Right. And so we're seeing a lot of challenges with, you know, in general, where are we supposed to work? You know, if, um, if you live with your partner or if you have a child, you know, who gets this space, who gets that space, and what if there isn't enough space? Um, and so that's a really big challenge trying to figure out, you know, we're all adjusting to this. So it's not just one person here, one person in the family, it's everybody. And so um, things like finding a place to work, um, creating privacy for yourself mm -hmm. is really challenging. Um, one of the things we talked about earlier was boundaries and how important it is to set boundaries. Um, there's a quote that I love and it says boundaries um, are meant to protect yourself, not change somebody else. And so creating boundaries with that intention that I'm doing this because I need this, not because I don't love you or care for you or I don't want to be next to you, but because of everything that's going on, I need to keep my boundaries up nice and strong. And what's really hard for other people in the family sometimes is that we expect people to read our minds. Right. And so we don't stop and think that maybe she said that because she needed space. Right. And did I do something wrong or did I make her mad? And go down a road that really only being able to talk about it can get you out of that right. negative space. Right. And I think one of the other things that we um, struggle to do is uh, be because of everything going on, we tend to either we isolate or we sometimes react. And so I think one of the things that's really important right now is acknowledging and naming and validating what you and your partner, or you and your roommate, or you and your child are experiencing. Hey, we're going through a really rough time right now. All of us are, and this is hard for you, and this is hard for me. How can we work through this together? I think that is critical because human beings need ritual. Mm -hmm. They need routine. Right. We're all human beings. And we all have to talk about it and name it in order to deal with it. Right. If you're in a family, uh, perhaps a really good idea is to talk with everybody in the family, even the two-year-old, right. about what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. What is your time to be um, with yourself? Mm -hmm. Or your time and what's my time? And explain it in ways that a child can understand right. so that it's very clear. It's an opportunity, actually, to even play a game. Oh, to for create sure. rules. Right. And to create, here's how we're all going to do this. And when we forget, here's how we're going to remind each other. Right. 
And I think you bring up uh, a really good point about you know creating rules and routines because without the communication with the people that are in your support system, whether it's your partner that you live with, your roommate, or your family members, um, we have to create new routines, and so and that's a tough thing to do without clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and so having the conversation of let's start some new rules. Things are different now, so. Um, like we were talking about earlier, for a, for a child who gets to play video games one hour a day, um, maybe now the rules are a little different because that child might not have other things to do. They might not be able to go see their friends or go play um, the sport or go to, go to band practice. And so you might change the rule. And so I think talking about it and figuring out what works best um, for the family and as they move forward is so important. Right. And also our extended family. I mean, the kids can't see their grandparents now. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't go out and visit a friend. So how do we all together create, um, hopefully, a temporary new reality? Right, <clears throat> right. And I think um, something to kind of consider is, you know, a lot of the time we're talking about how do, when are we gonna go back to normal? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's gonna be a new normal. You know, it's gonna be a new normal for our world, but also for our relationships, the way we interact with our family members, um, the way we interact with our partners, our friends, all of that is going to shift. And so I think figuring out what is a new normal going to look like so when our grandparents can talk to their grandchildren, what, is that gonna be different? You know, are they gonna be able to have hugs and kisses all the time or might there need to be a little bit more space? Yeah, and there's opportunities to play games, which you're more <laughs> aware of than I am, or read to your grandchild through over the phone through FaceTime. Um, so there, there are different ways that we've all got to be creative. Right. Um, in, 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 in regards to the games, I know for my clients, I'm a school-based therapist, I work with younger um, with, with youth, and so UNO, virtual UNO, virtual battleship, virtual Pictionary, all of those things have been such incredible ways to engage with my clients. And so for families that are a part for, you know, grandparents trying to connect with their grandchildren, for parents connecting with their children, aunties, uncles, whoever it may be, I think having that resource is um, is really fantastic. And you told me they're free. Yes, they're free. Yeah. There's not apps. You just type in the website and that's it. Yeah, so that is a really awesome thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the other thing that I think we're experiencing is all of us are going through grief and loss. Loss of our rituals, loss of our routines, loss of celebrations, how to do a birthday party now, right. how to um, even deal with the traditional, the, the thing we think of with loss, which is a death in the right. family or an illness where you would normally do, you would go visit. Right. Or you would normally give someone a hug and now you are restrained from doing that. Right. So have to come up with different ways to give support to each other. You're 100% right. I think we have a question, actually. Yes, well this one is, I find myself fighting with my partner about everything lately, from not putting up the dishes, to leaving drawers <laughs> open, working too late, the list goes on. We're at each other's throats now that we are alone 24 seven. How can we get back to a good spot? Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting that, that, that like you bring that up because I think this is something that so many couples are experiencing because again, we're shifting from having our space apart when we're at work or even if you know one partner is at work and one partner's at like we have space from each other during the day and we're not getting that anymore. So it makes sense that um, there's more time for conflict, there's more time for disagreements. And so um, I think, you know, kind of going back to what we were saying earlier, you know, uh, talking about boundaries, being intentional with your boundaries. If you're, uh, if we're communicating all day, every day, if we don't have that privacy from each other, then maybe that might be a tool that gives us some space for ourselves. And we can use that space to regulate ourselves, kind of find out what helps us stay uh, calm, cool, and collected. So whether it's going for a walk or meditating or reading a book or having a cup of coffee, Finding things that help bring you to your baseline and feel good makes it easier to when you go back to that conversation, you might be a little bit more prepared for disagreements. And being proactive and not wait until you're mad. Right. Uh, wait, going ahead and saying, you know, we're cooped up together and I can, I bet I'm getting on your nerves and you're, I know you're getting on mine a little bit. And so to talk about it before you get to that point where you're already 
to pull out your hair. For sure. Um, and then you have some agreement, here, I need my space. And even what are cues that you can um, see that somebody seems to be getting a little worked up. And so you say, okay, I'm going to go sit on the balcony and read a book for a while and give yourself space um, and give the other person space. For sure. I think respecting each other's boundaries is very important. And kind of like mm -hmm. you said, having that conversation. So again, we're talking about validating our own experience and each other's experiences in this relationship. And um, sometimes I think what I've also seen is because we're cooped up together, there's no time for intentionally spending time mm -hmm. with each other. And so even creating time to do that, so scheduling weekly dates where it's like, yes, we've been home together all day, but let's be intentional about the next two hours and plan a dinner together or go for a walk together or just lay down and watch some TV. Finding, being intentional about your actions, I think um, can help make some difference moving forward. And it's a way to calm yourself altogether because we're living in a time with great uncertainty. Yes. And so when we are living in a time with high anxiety and uncertainty, it helps us every time we take control of something. Right. And making a plan and having a discussion are ways to take control. Right, right. And I mean, overall, this, like you said, you know, there's so much uncertainty. We don't know when we're going to have our own space again. We don't know when one of us is going to go back to work. Or even with schools um, opening in mm -hmm. August or September, there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. And so I think, you know, having discussions about, you know, in a few months, if this is still the way things are, then what can we do to make sure that we um, can unite through this and feel confident moving forward? And one of the things I've been hearing um, from our staff here at Chris 180 is that um, the kids in our group homes are beginning to get, um, they've handled this very well for a while, but now they're getting irritated with one another. Right. And so people getting on your nerves um, and how we, how we manage that by taking control and creating right. space is really important because I mean, we've all thought it's going to be temporary. Now he's going, how long is it going to really be? Um, I think, you know, so we've talked a lot about being in the home with mm -hmm. people and um, kind of going back to relationships where you're far apart, mm -hmm. um, people in long distance relationships. Um, we talked a little mm -hmm. earlier about grandparents and grandchildren uh, being apart, parents and children. I, like I said earlier, I haven't seen my family in two months and that's been really tough. And so we all respond to things differently. I kind of, when I'm anxious, I isolate. And so I'm okay being in my little bubble until I'm not. Um, and then, but knowing my mom, I know she wants, she calls me every day. You know, why aren't you answering your phone? Are you okay? And it's because, you know, typically, even before we live apart, but she knew that I could come and visit mm -hmm. um, and not having the, the, um, the level of comfort knowing that my child is going to see me soon mm -hmm. can bring forth a lot of fear and anxiety about when am I going to see my family soon? Um, how is it going to be when I see them? Am I going to have to sit in the car while they're in the house and wave goodbye? You know, it's, it's really normal to feel um, uncomfortable and unsafe and scared. Um, especially with having so much distance between um, people that you love. And I know I'm a hugger, and so I, it's really hard for me right. not to be able to um, touch the people I care about. I get so excited when I see a live person and not a person on Zoom. Um, <laughs> so it's, um, it's, it, it's important also, I think, to know yourself a little bit and know how, how you react and to give grace to other people because we're all different. For sure. And I can't assume that everyone's like me because they're not. And it's really important to understand that um, we don't need to really be judgmental about the person in the community who uh, I think they should be doing something else because they're not when we don't know the backstory, we don't know what's going on in that person's life. And we don't, um, so giving people grace and, and having some compassion for 
people grieve in different ways. People have different coping skills and people have different reasons for not being comfortable with certain things. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think we actually have a question. Yeah, so this one is around kids and it says, my kids are worried about summer plans and I don't necessarily have the answers for them. It's causing stress because they want to know why we can't go to the beach when they see other families going or why camps are closed. I don't think I can stomach another Zoom class this summer for them. What to do? Wow. I mean, first of all, the stress is normal, right? Having your children at home is a huge change for so many families and so many parents. Um, and it makes sense that your child wants to do what the other kids in their class are doing. If, they're, if the other children are going to the beach, they want to do as well. Can I go to the beach? So it makes sense why they're questioning it. And I think this is a time where um, being transparent and clear about why we aren't able to do this. And these, these are our concerns. And sometimes I like to tell parents um, that I work with, you know, if, you, if this is something that you're not comfortable doing, um, providing your child a different option. Mm -hmm. So we can't go to the beach, instead we can do this. Um, and so this way you're, you're showing your child that we're not doing this to hurt you in any way. We're trying to protect you and we know this is hard. And so there's some things that we can do and some things that we can't. Um, and so kind of having that conversation with them, being transparent, being clear, I think is a way to start. Honesty with kindness is always the best policy. So being transparent, explaining, and explaining that people make different decisions. It's an opportunity to, to teach your children about how to give other people grace and space and understand that people have different ways of making decisions that I as a parent may not agree with, so we're gonna make this decision, um, but other people have a right to make their own decisions and it's um and to explain why i don't agree um, and to be transparent about that but children need to learn decision making and so it's an opportunity to role model how you make decisions and go through the thought process that's different than trying to um, um, explain something beyond a child's ability to understand and to tell them these are all the reasons why um, without teaching, taking the opportunity to teach them about a decision-making process. I agree. And you know, all behavior makes sense in context. Mm -hmm. um, and understanding that um, I made this decision because this makes sense for me. I choose to self-isolate because it makes me feel safer and I'm comfortable and okay with it. Um, on the other hand, somebody else might want to go outside and need to be in social situations because that's where they thrive. And so understanding that all behaviors make sense in context mm -hmm. and helping and finding developmentally appropriate ways to teach that to your children kind of, you know, kind of back to what you said is, is, is so important. So they're not only understanding why you're making this choice, but why other people might make this choice. Exactly. Choice. Exactly. I think there are lots of opportunities now to teach your kids how to handle anxiety, how to calm themselves down. The clinical term for that is self-regulation. <laughs> but um, you said calm, cool, and collected. That's an easy way to understand that. Um, but it's an there are lots of opportunities. There are lots of teaching moments in this current crisis. We have a question. Yeah, so this one says, what can people in long distance relationships do to stay connected? Um, so we actually did talk about this a little bit, um, you know, I think, so I have a lot of friends and a lot of people that I'm close to that are in long distance relationships and one of the challenges is, first we couldn't see each other that much anyways because you were far and now you can't see each other because you can't see each other. Um, and so I think right now going back to this is hard for us, we're not able to see each other. How do we intentionally take time to spend time with each other? Um, sending videos, sending cards, acknowledging that our time apart, hopefully is temporary and we will have some time in the future to be able to see each other. And um, just acknowledging that right now we can't be with each other and this is difficult. And so how can we still be connected 
even if they aren't physically connected. Right, and I just thought about the situation about what if you're visiting someone mm -hmm. and um, you're stuck there, and right. it's not even in your own home. Or if you, um, I was talking to somebody and they were talking about wanting to go back home. Um, and they couldn't go back home because they didn't feel safe fly, flying on a commercial uh, aircraft, which I will say, the airline industry, I was watching this thing on Delta, um, and they were um, showing how they were fumigating the planes right. and, and take the steps they were taking. So hopefully it will be safe at some point right. for people to reconnect. But for right now, people have really been stuck. They've been stuck wherever they were visiting at the time. And I think, um, for people in long distance relationships, you know, regardless of whether it's a romantic relationship or a familiar relationship or a friendship, what we were talking about earlier is, you know, find using technology, finding ways to creatively connect with each other, um, is is so important. Um, I think, you know, planning virtual dates is something that I've seen a lot of. Is you know, you make dinner on your side, I'll make dinner on my side, and we can eat dinner together. That's or, great. Right, and so or we're planning um, to play games together mm -hmm. or just things that we wish we could do if we were together, but let's find a creative way to go about it now. Well, but who know? Yes. <laughs> Battleship. Pictionary. Yeah. Pictionary. Those are opportunities too. Right, right. So, I agree. Or There's, watching the same movie and talking about yes. it. Yes, yes. And I think, um, I know Netflix right now has the ability to do a house party where you can start a show or a movie at the same time. And so with with friends, we've done that, and so we can watch a movie, and then while we're watching a movie, we can text each other and be like, oh my gosh, did you just see that? Mm -hmm. um, or I can't believe this just happened. And so you're doing it in live time, even if you're in separate homes. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a pretty, it's been a pretty great uh, tool for sure. Oh, we have a question. So this one is about friendships, and it says, I'm single and living alone right now in the quarantine period. I haven't left the house in months and I'm starting to feel really sad and lonely. Any tips on how I can strengthen my mental health and what should I tell friends? I don't want them to worry. Well, loneliness was a national problem in the U.S. prior to this pandemic. I mean, I think three in five people describe themselves as lonely. And so you can just imagine what happened, what's happening now is anxiety and loss piled on top of some of the feelings that already existed. And so journaling is good, um, planning, structuring your day and saying, I am going to call two people today at this time <laughs> or in this time period and give it in creating a structure for yourself that involves daily contact with another person. It can be a call, it could be setting up a game or watching a movie, now that I know that that's possible. Um, but what are, to be very intentional, I think um, Nitha said earlier about intentionality, I think that's critically important. To recognize I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling isolated, so I'm going to do something about it. The way to get through traumatic experiences is to take control of what you can control. And that would be a proactive way to help deal with I'm isolated. And if I don't want friends to worry about me, you know, I can call them and tell them I'm okay. And I think kind of speaking a little bit more to that, we have, we have support systems that function differently now, mm -hmm. as we talked about earlier. So our friends that we could go to before, they were going through their own stuff, and so they might not be able to hold space right. for us. And so for the people that are our usual go-tos, you know, when I'm feeling this way, I can call you. They may not be able to be that person for me right now. And it's not to say that they don't care for me and that they're not there for me. It's more so that I have to acknowledge that they may be at their limit right now and they can't take anything else in. And so I might have to use secondary resources like different groups of people or practice journaling or practice different techniques and strategies to help me feel more connected or more regulated or more, you know, comfortable. Um, but I know we talked about the phrase holding space and it's a phrase that clinicians use often and it's not something that um, 
that is, it's not everyday lingo. Um, and so the way I explain it to my clients is, um, you know, if you're at 100, that's your, that's your full limit. If you get to 102, what happens? It can spill over to different people in your life and your family. Let me hold that two for you. Let me hold that point two so you don't have to take it anywhere else. Let me be that person. And so I define it as I'm holding space for your extra two so you don't have to worry about it. And I think that's really important. It goes back to, again, recognizing that we're going through a very similar circumstance right now, but we're all individuals and we all react differently. We have another question. Yeah, so sticking to the friendship topic, this one is, I'm fighting with a friend over our different needs during this time. This friend wants to go out and party in a few weeks, and I think it's dangerous. How can we meet in the middle? Because I'm not ready for that. Well, I think... I think first of all, it's okay to have different opinions. Um, you know, we can we can have different opinions and still be able to connect on different levels. And so, kind of what we were talking about earlier, understanding where the other person is coming from and what is uh, leading them to feel this way. If I'm self isolating, you know, understanding why I'm doing this, and if my friend wants to go out and be in public, you know, what might be driving that? Maybe they are a person who is having a really difficult time being home alone right now and we need to have that social interaction to be able to thrive. Um, and then ultimately kind of managing your expectations knowing that we might not be able to agree on this for some time and that doesn't mean that I'm not your friend and I don't care for you but right now we're disagreeing and that's okay. I think that's really important. It gets back to the, having grace and compassion for other people. I mean, we're all different and we all need different things. And there are some people who are highly social. So also, what is the, is there a hobby? Or I know someone who is a highly social person and was talking to me about going out all the time on the weekends and going to dinner and seeing friends. And she's painting now, which is something that she had done before that she kind of dropped out of. And now she's painting again and really being happy about that and proud of herself. Um, so there, we need to kind of look into ourselves and see are there things that gave me pleasure that I've gotten too busy to do and now we've got more time. Um, and so just really quick, one of the things that we, uh, you've mentioned it quite a bit, but we haven't named it is um, self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Um, looking inside and saying, you know, where is where are my thoughts and feelings coming from, and what do they mean, and what do I do with this? Um, you brought that up a few times, so I know we haven't said that, but self-reflection is such an important part of getting us individually and in our relationship where we want to go. Um, oh, we have another question. So this is a comment around social media usage and watching the news. Do you all think that there could be too much of that causing strife amongst people? Well, I think everyone is different. Um, you know, for some people, it's important to stay connected into what's going on in the world. And so um, their routines include watching the, watching the news, following social media, reading different articles. And for some people, what I've noticed personally is the more I look at it, the more anxious I become. So what I've had to do is, again, going back to boundaries, I've had to set no more than 20 minutes a day while I spend time looking at this on media because I know the results of it now. And I know it doesn't help me. And so figuring out what works for you and what doesn't, and knowing that there's no right or wrong answer to this, it's figuring out, again, what works for you. I think that's so important. There's no right or wrong answer. And we have to watch our tendency to judge other people when they're different than us and are doing something different than us. Um, I, am, I watch the news all the time. Um, and it doesn't increase my anxiety. It helps me give me more data to be able to make decisions on. So it's, it's different for different people. And that's okay. Exactly. <laughs> well, I really appreciate being able to share this time with you, Nika, because um, it is, I'll just say personally, it's encouraging for me as a marriage and family therapist who's been a marriage and family therapist a long time to um, see young 
younger marriage and family therapists who are so in tune and so confident and so wonderful and are able to articulate um, the uh, perspective of marriage and family therapists. So um, I do own my bias here. Um, at Chris 180, we're really privileged to have therapists like Nita and others who have areas of specialty that really are available to help people in the community. If you need help, um, you can feel free to call us and we have incredibly talented therapists like Nita who can be there and be available and help you work through any challenges you have. So appreciate you watching today and appreciate um, your support and your taking care of your own self during this time. Thank you so much, ladies, for being here. Thank you all for watching today. We want to continue to be a resource during this time. And so like we say every week, reach out to Chris 180 if you need assistance. You can go to our website, as Kathy mentioned, chris180.org to make an appointment with any one of our licensed clinicians. And we'll be happy to talk to you through this time. We also are available for telehealth sessions that you can do in the privacy of your own home. Also check out our blog at chris180.org slash blog where you can get 24-7 access to our clinicians through the words that they have written about grief and loss, routines and structure, and even some family-friendly activities to keep your kids busy during this time. We continue to need your support now more than ever before. So if you have the means to give in this season of crisis, please do so today. You can also go to our website, chris180.org, to give today. We'll see you back here next week for another edition of our Lunchtime Live series. Have a great week.